Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are and whenever you are. Welcome to the ServiceNow community live stream. My name is Chuck Tomasi from ServiceNow, and I am here to bring you not only answers in the community, but the thought process that goes on behind those answers, the, the journey of discovery, how we get to the answers so that you can take those skills to your organization to be a better, more effective ServiceNow administrator and developer. So with that said, let's get into it with the pre-roll. I'm just going to do a quick refresh on this screen to make sure that we are actually streaming. It's It's been an interesting journey. I apologize for not being around for a while. The, uh, oh, it's just been an interesting journey. I'm going to leave it at that. Let me bring up the chat. Long time no see Shane, Carolyn and Dave. Thank you for hanging out. Uh, lots of travel in this quarter of two now at work and all over the place, different conferences. And when I am at home, I'm usually battling uh, a, an upload issue. That was the primary reason why I couldn't stream for the last several weeks is because I didn't have the upload speeds. I am broadcasting from my home and that means I need all kinds of bandwidth, which I am paying for and not always receiving. So I was in a tangle with the internet service provider. That turned out to be resolved. Then I got in a tangle with Google, which I am still not sure, but I've had 48 hours of decent upload speeds, so I'm going to leave it at that. Fingers crossed everything works out perfectly here today. Let's go on to YouTube. We are doing this on YouTube when I do broadcast. I have I think I've ironed out the wrinkles on that as well. Creating an event, you may have seen the notification. I know some of you are waiting eagerly for this to start. Thank you very much. And uh, you should see a subscription. I don't see it now that it is actually broadcasting, but when it goes live, there it is. Hey, that's cool. Let me bring that up. We've got the notification that we are live streaming as well as on Twitch over here. So subscribe to those channels, get the notifications, and you can get that information as well. So thank you very much for hanging out with us there. Twitch is often a good backup plan in case YouTube isn't working I will try to do these again. I am on the road a bit this week, so it's it's going to be hit and miss. Maybe Thursday morning when I return, maybe Friday morning. A lot of it depends on what's on my plate and am I jet lagged, you know, that kind of thing. This is done uh, out of the goodness of my heart. I truly believe in sharing this information with you when I get it. I have been working on some projects, so I do have some deep dive topics that I'd love to explore with you. Continuing on, if you've got a question, if you if you want to just say hello, where you're from, how's the weather? I know it's it's winter time in many regions of the northern hemisphere, and uh, becoming more and more summer like down under. But it, it, give me a shout out on the uh, chat in either one of those forums if you've got more than a question. If, actually, if you've got more than a shout out, if you've got a question or problem, be sure to post that in the community in the proper group. If you go over to communities on the side, you will see a list of wonderful groups there. There is also a big plus button up here that will show you the various community sub communities. So put things in the right area. Make sure you only post it once. Your typical good community etiquette that uh, you would observe anywhere else. Search before you post, that kind of thing. Details, pictures always help. What is the uh, reason? Good morning, Chris. Good morning, John. Yes, technology is working for us once again. All right. Also want to uh, recommend that you stop over at, see if I can get this right. Am I on the right keyboard? Am I on the right spot? That's the developer portal. Oh, let's, you know what? Let's just switch to the screen. Long time, no practice. Developer.ServiceNow, I encourage you to go over there. Free developer instance, free learning plans, uh, latest release, early access to the latest release. So when Orlando comes out this spring, you will have that six to eight weeks in advance of general availability. You can test it, you can try it. Looking forward to sharing that information with you when the time comes. So go over there. API documentation is great. Blogs from the developer evangelist. Videos. There's a YouTube channel over there as well. So take a look. I am getting parched already. Some wonderful herbal tea in my new ServiceNow Corksicle mug that I got from the ServiceNow store. <laughs> Eventually, maybe we'll make that stuff public. 
So take a look at developer.servicenow.com. And from there, it's meetups. Meetups over at meetup.com slash pro slash service now developer meetup. How many chapters do we have? We have over 20,000 people. That's how long it's been since I've been here. We've got about 1,000 more than we did before. 60 groups. We're up about four groups around the U.S. Looks like we got one in Mexico. I didn't know that was there. And meetups, meetups, meetups going on all the time, 18 different countries. If you're near one of these, I invite you to check it out if you haven't already. We've got one coming up this week in Phoenix on Thursday night. We've got one, I don't know, meetup doesn't sort these chronologically. Look at this, December 12th, December 11th, December 17th, December 11th. You figure it out. If you want a more chronologically sane place to go, over to the events page here on developer.servicenow.com. We've got Amsterdam coming up tomorrow. Orlando coming up tomorrow. A lot of people squeezing one in right before the holidays, including us in Phoenix. So I look forward to seeing you there if you happen to attend to that. Otherwise, go over to meetup.com, sign up. You'll get notifications when it comes around. If you happen to travel, maybe you're one of these people that go between a couple of sites, sign up for two. You never know where you'll be, when you'll be there. Maybe you'll get to go to Tampa in the winter and say, hey, we've got a vacation. Let me keep tabs on that. Maybe the vacation will align with a developer meetup. Always fun. That being said, let's go on to um, knowledge. Knowledge is coming. How many days away you think it is? I know it's less than 180. We are inside that 12-month, or six-month zone. And knowledge is, there it is. Oh, boy. You're going to love this. 146 days away. Call for speakers will be opening very, very soon. Keep your eye on your email box for that. We will be opening that up. Jason told me it could be as early as this week. So keep your eye out for Call for Speakers. Oh, I forgot to mention, this is the show for December 9th, 2019. So when I reference this week, you'll know what week it is. Makes sense. Just a wee bit out of practice. <laughs> so keep your eye open for that. That will, uh, oh, I don't have that on the screen. That's why it looks so funny. There, 146 days until we get there. Otherwise, it's May 3rd through May 7th. 2020. I know that seems like a long way off, but it's not too, it's still 2019. There may be time to ask your boss for budget, for justification. If you do get a call for speakers, hey, free pass. You know, if you are chosen as a speaker, that's terrific. We'd love to see you there. Networking opportunities and hands-on labs. Those of you who've been there, be sure to tell your coworkers the value you get out of that and bring more because there's all levels of organization get value out of this. Whether you're a developer, an admin, just getting started, there's training that goes on. There's a hackathon that happens. CIOs, there's stuff. Just this is the major conference for ServiceNow in Orlando, Florida this year. We are not going back to Vegas this year. I heard possibly next year in 2021. Really depends on the venues. So more room to spread out, more room to do stuff. Just relaxing, less stairs to climb, but horizontal instead of vertical in this venue. <laughs> Hope to see you there in Orlando, Florida, May 3rd. And I got to check my cues. That's why I have this little cheat sheet in front of me. I don't have any postings for uh, upcoming webinars. We had one on the 26th. Craig Stepp, Jeremy Duncan, and I had covered one regarding uh, making your, let me get this back, making your web your instance, global, internationalization, translation, language independent, things like that. And uh, I invite you to watch that. That is available on our YouTube channel over, well, you can find it from the community if you search for the Tech Now episodes list. Episode 70. Episode 71 is coming out next week on the 17th. Is that next week already? Oh my goodness, it is. So next week, December 17th, we will be talking about various ways you can move your changes in data, your, your code, your config data between instances. We'll be talking about update sets, of course, GitHub repos, app repos, the store, exporting XML. There's various ways and which ones are appropriate for uh, what you need. So keep an eye out for that. I believe the registration link is available. If you go to... I'm going to give you the secret URL if you want to find the holy grail of all ServiceNow TechNow episodes. You go to bit.ly 
servicenow.com slash servicenow dash technow. Okay, servicenow dash technow, bit.ly. And there is the episode list. And if I remember right, down here, list some episode by episode by episode. Down here is 70. Let's get there. 70 was the one that Craig did. 71, move it. Getting data and code moved with ease. That is where we're going. And we have a register link. So if you want to pre-register for that, go ahead and take a look. We will be happy to be there. Jeremy will be doing the majority of the content. I'll be helping out where appropriate. So invite you to go look at that. And are we done? No, because any script we write today will in fact be posted to bit.ly slash sn dash cls over on GitHub. I have a GitHub repo with dated folders. So if we happen to run into a question on the community or I'm writing something, I will post that in the 2019-12-09. There's no folder. It means we didn't write any code today. So you'll know. You just run over there. The link on the video description on YouTube and in the community will also point directly to that folder if it exists. If not, it will point to the top-level folder in which you can explore other dates for the last year and a half that we've been collecting code snippets. So have fun with that. If you are new to JavaScript then and, and you say, hey, I'd like to learn more, I invite you to take a look at Learning JavaScript on the Now Platform video series at bit.ly slash sn dash learn dash js. I know that's a bit of a mnemonic, but it's easier than the 2x3a4z thing that they usually give you from bit.ly. Thought I'd give them a vanity URL and go through those one by one. Those have been very popular since I released them in July. Thank you very much for everybody who's watched and commented and solved the lab exercises, the problems, and posted those back. Appreciate it very much. Everybody seems to be very excited and enthused about those. So happy to deliver those and glad you're getting a lot of value out of them. From there, I think that's our last one. Yes. Let's go back and... Oh, good tea. Good tea. I am in the community. I'm going to do a quick refresh since we've been talking for a while. And I'm going to look at some unreplied questions. Let's take something fresh off the top of the... Can I run scheduled jobs from postman or curl command? It's not about the technical requirement. It's about what are you trying to do? I've written a scheduled script in a global application. I want to execute from external environment like postman or curl commands. Is it possible? If yes, please let me know how to achieve it. All right. What is scheduled jobs are done on a schedule? Hence the name. Big smiley face there. They should not, should not be triggered by an external trigger. If your aim, let's back that up. If, oh, that is only one line. If your aim is to run a script on demand based on an external trigger, I recommend looking at Flow Designer. I'll show you something I, I did that I was demoing last week in, in uh, Las Vegas for the AWS conference. Some of you may have seen this before. You can create a very simple table, very simple table that records records, then flow designer or, or business rule. If you have to run script, Create a very simple table that re that uh, creates records. And then the BR, BR or flow reacts to that. So you get a log entry that validates your API is working, e.g. table API that creates Record table rest. Let's do a table rest API. Spell it out. Don't know who knows how much. Table rest API that creates records. And that triggers the functionality you have in your current 
scheduled job. All right, flow designer business role. Let's go over to my instance that has an application called Mocha, not Macho. Didn't realize until those just now those were spelled the same way. And I use this as a demonstration of the Amazon Dash smart buttons. These, you click these, it triggers a Lambda function which turns around and sends uh, an API over to ServiceNow into this function. That API simply creates a table in the click table. So I've got a table of clicks that records what button was pushed, how much voltage it's got, was it a single, double, or a long press, because you've got three different types of uh, events you can press with that button. That's all it does. This is a log. Oh, this button was pushed at this time. This button was pushed at this time, and this is who pushed it. It doesn't say any detail about what it should do. That click table acts as a trigger, so when a click is created, I can then go in and say, oh, based on that, was the click type single, double, or long? And take additional logic from there. Now I can do what I need to do. Ideally, and I understand it's coming, I don't know when, if it's Orlando, Paris, or whatever, ideally I'd like the scripted, the table API or some other REST API to act as the trigger instead of having this intermediary table. Not that there's anything wrong with that, I still get a log entry out of it and I can parse it and I can take things like the payload from Amazon that says 1077 MVA, strip off the MVA, turn the 1077 into a decimal. That could, it clean up the data before I put it into the table because this is actually a decimal number, but it's not delivered as a decimal number. I can take the device ID, the device serial number from that device, which comes in as 16 characters, MD04, GW, blah, blah, blah and turn that into something reasonable that I've got in a different table called buttons. That's just a reference field. So when I see a record that says, this button was hit, what I'm really getting is the reference to that button. And if it's not a registered button, I don't register the click, which is also another level of protection that I suppose you could get. So that's one way that I can see that solution playing out in a very similar scenario that I built there. Now, whether or not they want to do that in Flow Designer, and keep it as scriptless as possible, or write a business rule. Maybe they've already spent, invested some time in that logic. Uh, you could transplant that from the scheduled job into a business rule, check the advance button, and away you go. All right, good, good. Well, let's close that off. Do I have anything in the inbox I need to follow up on? I forgot to do my follow-up section. Yes, there are a couple. Okay, what are the interview questions on workflow? That's all this said. What I, and I said, can you explain? Are you interviewing somebody for a workflow position? I don't understand. Uh, this really wasn't all that clear. Somebody else has responded, said, scratchpad and business rules and workflow. What is rollback, turnstile activity, core activities and workflow? Honestly, I, I personally don't believe in asking a lot of technical questions in interviews. I, I, I don't think that fully determines if somebody can fit into your organization. I am a firm believer in behavioral style questions. This is not related to anything technical in the community. So take it for what it's worth. I've been a manager in the past. I am currently not a manager, but I continue to study and listen and learn about interviewing styles. I've got children and their spouses that are coming into the job market that I pass this information on to. It if you are a manager doing an interview, ask behavioral style questions. Tell me about a time when you had to write a complex workflow. Okay. You will get a better answer out of that than perhaps something they read on the community. They may be book smart, but if they don't have the experience and they don't know about that, tell me about a time you had a difficult requirement that was had a complex workflow. Okay. What did you use? How did you get out of that? What challenges did you see? Who did you have to work with? Then you can get into the, those types of deeper questions. And if they mention Flow, you say, oh, did you choose uh, the graphical workflow or flow designer and why? You know, why did they choose one over the other? Maybe they don't have flow designer experience and your organization is looking to go there. Why would I interview them and find out, do you know about the turnstile activity? That's that's not relevant. I if you, if you know they can learn, that's great. Then they can learn a new technology. If you're looking to maintain something old, I'd be a little more reluctant about that. So... 
That's my two cents on interviewing skills. Behavioral stock. Give me a time when, uh, tell me about an example of those types of things. You'll find out if they truly know. And, you know, if you're the candidate on the other side, you don't have that experience, say, haven't run into that yet, but I'm eager to learn. You know, show some enthusiasm. I mean, don't, don't, don't fake it. Don't lie. Your coworkers will figure it out real fast. Allowing manager of groups to control the groups. Interesting question here. They said, I've been asked to allow managers of groups to control the groups, but only the ones they are the managers of. This is a very specific use case. I love the idea, but it's not that straightforward. Can someone point me to a step-by-step? My situation, my, my recommendation, this is fairly complex. It's not, a, it's not trivial, but it is doable. And that's kind of how I signed off in this article. First, note that the ACL on sys user group, which is the group table, requires ITIL user admin or admin to be able to write records to that group. The membership table is sys underscore user underscore gr member. And if I look at that, sys user gr member, I can type it up here dot list. And once I'm at that table, it's really just a connection of this user belongs to this group. This group has this user. It's the same many-to-many table used at the related list for users that show what groups they're in and what groups have what members. If I go to configure security rules. I already elevated my access and I look for write permission. Let's filter on, filter on write, show matching. Then sys user GR member, there's two, one for the record itself, which has user admin, same as before, and a little script, and fields, which is sys user GR member star, that's all the fields, also has user admin. So first thing you need to do is grant those people user underscore admin role. Bad practice, just granting a user a role. Good practice, create a group, Put people in that group and grant those that group that role. So you'll, you'll spend less time maintaining it. In fact, you can automate some of this maintenance. So when you go and edit a group, if the group manager changes, you can modify this exact, not this exact table, this exact table, the sys user, sys user GR member. Let's go back to that again. Not ACLs, group members. This table, you can put a business rule on there that says, hey, the manager changed. It's no longer Tom, it's Steve. So you take Tom out of the group manager's group, if you want to think of it that way. They disinherit that role, user admin, and cannot do that anymore. But recognize by granting them the user underscore admin role. It gets fun there because you just opened up users, roles, group, group memberships, what users have roles. There's a lot of stuff that that enables. So now you have to go through all of these right ACLs for all of those tables and put a special rule on there and say, you know what? Normally, if you had user admin, you'd be able to write to this table, but I need to check. Are you in this group and are you the manager? Because you only want to give them access to one table, sys user gr member. Otherwise, all that other stuff is off. You go, look, I know you have user admin, but you're part of this group, so you don't get to play here. Otherwise, if you're not part of that group, fine, go ahead. You shouldn't have that role if you're not part of that group or you're not a true user admin, admin, that kind of thing. So again, not trivial, but doable. But you better be very very prescriptive and test a lot of those ACL scenarios before you get into that. So yes, it's doable. Somebody else responded back and said, you can try to write ACLs on a group table, which only allow the group manager only to control. That's kind of what I said in this longer one. For whatever reason, I've noticed that the notifications on the community, don't know if this is still the case because I haven't checked in a week or so. Uh, the notifications are coming in a little later it's it's very bizarre. I will comment on a post and then I'll be told in the inbox, hey, this person created the post. Well, why would I find out about creating the post after I have maintained it? So it's it's very 
surreal. I know Dan, our, our chief architect on the community, is looking into that if it hasn't already been fixed. Okay. Whew. Add a new line slash record in variable set type multi-row. I think somebody's already created this. Let me do a refresh since I've been talking for about 10 minutes, or it feels like it. <clears throat> and many of these are probably already answered. So let's go back to unreplied. Deleting available for using background script. Not sure what that means. Where are they looking at? I experts, I have a scenario where I want to delete the available for SC cat item user criteria M to M records and need to update with new records in the same table in development instance. And then I'm thinking of moving the new record in XML from dev to test instance. Can you advise, is this the right approach or not? I have 190,000 records in available for thinking of deleting through background script. I have to delete or remove this record because the data is not correct. You could do that. You could do that easily enough via script background. Just be sure to test first. Make sure your query is right. And then uncomment the dangerous part here. So they gave us the table name, which is very nice. I can use that. Let's go and write a script. I'm going to bring up VS Code. <gasps> Get to write script today. There is a way to do this without doing a while loop. And I will show that to you because I often forget it's there. So I don't need the release notes. Thank you. So I can say bar delete gr. I try to stay away from the variable gr just because it's too generic and could get you into weirdness. New glide record table name semicolon. Then you could say Dell GR, there's no qualifier on here, so add Dell GR dot add query statements here if needed. Dell GR dot query. And what I like to do is just do a quick GS dot info Dell GR. Yeah, Dell GR dot get row count. Call that function records found. Let me put a comment there. Check to see if you get the right number of records before making this live. And then finally, uncomment this to make it delete all the records, which will be del gr dot delete multiple. This is like the only place I use this is in a scripts background. And I can check the reference on that. Use events. Let's do this. Delete multiple. Another one that I forget to use all the time is update multiple. I was doing this on 2,500 records last week and needed to set the active flag to false on 2,500 records. So I set up my query. I got the right number. Then I did uh, set value and then update multiple. So in the API, we have delete multiple, delete multiple, deletes multiple records according to current where clause. This is for New York, and here is delete multiple. Here's an example. You do have to query before you do the delete multiple. <clears throat> so now that I've got that script. No, stop. Please stop. I'm not there yet. I don't want to do that. Let's paste that into the post. Andy dandy little curly braces here to insert a code sample, set that to JavaScript, and that way coloring and or alignment comes out nicely. Oops, I didn't comment it out. <laughs> that would have been nice. 
There. Okay. Reply. I have not been... I am off my game. I have not been doing my reply bell. Or no. That's it. I have to teach an old dog a new trick. Creating problem task on submission of problem. Sounds like another simple script. My requirement is that when I submit a problem ticket, I should redirect the problem, re redirect to problem task form where I get pre-populated some fields from problem and upon submit the problem, I should redirect back to problem ticket. Okay, uh, that would involve creating or modifying a UI action when you save the problem. The key to making this happen is twofold. There's action.setRedirectURL, and that can either be a URL and action.setReturnURL. Parameter to both is either a glide record or a URL. If you want to pre-populate the problem task, then you need to use a URL with a sysparm query query argument, something like this. Action dot set redirect redirect URL. Send them to problem under task dot do question mark sysparm query equals short description, it's field name, equals plus current dot short description, for example. Probably should have put that in a little code block. Let's do that. Just for beautification sake, JavaScript, paste, and I don't know if these are still kind of weirdly documented, but set what did I just type? Wow, my brain is absolutely fried right now. Set redirect URL. Let's find that. Search set redirect URL. And is it in the APIs finally? No. Why this action object is not set, I don't know. Or did I type it wrong? This is where I go and look at an example. Studio. Let's open up any old app favorite one I like to pick on while I'm on this series, the CLS 528, which means I created this back in May. Probably time to z-boot this thing. Code search up there in the corner and search all applications for action.set redirect URL. Search, search, search should find about a million of them. So here's an example, and here's another example. This one uses a URL, and it gets the current table name with get table name. Dot do, I think I put a dot do in there, yes. Problem um, under task got to, then you put your parameters after that. Oops, didn't need to go over there. Sorry about the tab jumping around. Got to find where I'm going. But there's no docs page that you can reference for this yet. I, that, that part blows me away. Oops, I forgot to put in the second half. Where's my response? Oh, three replies. Let's refresh that page. Don't know that you need three, two business rules. That's exactly what this is for. But that being said, different options, different people. It is 
35 minutes past the hour. I am going to shift gears here. There's a couple of things I wanted to cover with you while I was here. The first is, let me pull up my notes because I can't remember. That's why I wrote them down. Oh, a follow-up. I never did get back to the follow-up. There was a question in the community about G underscore scratch pad. If you're not familiar, G underscore scratch pad is an object you can access in display business rules. You put things in there. It is a completely blank object. Display business rules run when you load a page in the standard list and forms UI. So you could say, hey, when this page is loaded, put these elements into Scratchpad and it can pass those to the client script. So you don't have to do an Ajax call to get information. If you just want to push it once and say, you know what, there's data that's not on the form that I want you to have access to because client scripts can only access what's on the form. If it's not in the current view, you're not going to get it, but there may be fields that you want. For example, you may even want to run a function that says, are there attachments? So on the server side, you run gs.hasattachments or current.hasattachments and says true or false. You either have attachments on this record or you don't. And then the client script can access that. Very simple. G underscore scratch pad. Well, I said, is this available in any other business rules? And it was a fairly good discussion. Came up and said, uh, no, it's only available in business rules, display business rules, and it's used to display the variables. It's not available I did run a test. It's not available in befores, afters, or asyncs. It will quite literally, if you just put a, you know, G scratch pad equals hello world or some property equals hello world. And you'll see in the log, it doesn't know what G scratch pad is. That is exclusive to display business rules. You could theoretically create your own global variable and access that as a scratch pad type of thing. Don't know if I'd recommend that. Global variables are dangerous unless you're really, really good at scoping. So that is the answer. I don't know why this is still marked unresolved. Several people responded with the same thing. So if you've ever used G Scratch Pad, it's a wonderful tool. If you haven't, it's still a wonderful tool for passing that one push operation when a form is loaded. Okay, that was my follow-up. I also want to talk about one that I learned quite some time ago called sysverb underscore cancel. If you look at UI actions, we are in the CLS 528. So let's go to the CLS application. Let's say I've got this person's table. And in here, well, this has all kinds of fun stuff in it, doesn't it? It's sort of my scratch pad app. I go to configure UI actions or in studio. Let's do that. Let's do file, switch, CLS 528. Oh, I am in 528. Never mind. Wonderful, wonderful, because I did that search earlier. And create server development UI action. If, for example, back up, go back to my purses. Do I have any mandatory fields in here? I have social security number, which is mandatory. So let's say I have many mandatory fields and maybe a fairly complex algorithm of how I want to fill this form out. I don't even see the social security number there now. I'm not sure what's going on with this form. Now let's put um, John Q public. And I try to save that. It says, of course, hey, you've got a mandatory field there. You can't save. But if my process were to take a stepped approach or it's a long form or somebody doesn't know all the information, it's in a draft state, for example. Maybe I'm submitting a change request and I don't know all that information yet. We can have it in this draft state until we submit it. I want to temporarily look the other way on those forms. So let's go to Studio and say Save as Draft on the table, CLS 528 person, that's the table I'm on. We'll make it a form button for now. And this action name field, very important. I recommend as a best practice, giving your actions an action name. If I were to just say save as draft, that would be fine. It's an identifier to the other UI actions to make sure that there's no conflicts. If it's blank, it's just kind of ignored. But if you've got other UI actions, this one doesn't, 
We've got the typical ones, the ones that are standard, save, submit, update, that sort of thing. But it makes sure that you don't have conflicts. That What I mean is if you've got a button that says save and another one that says draft and they both have the same action name, it's only going to display one of those. I think it's the one with the lowest order. So very helpful for not getting you into trouble. Now, you could have a button with the save and a button with and a, and a drop down menu form action. Let's try that again. A form menu action with the same UI action name, and it will show up in both places. But you can't have two in the same place, the same, you can't have two form buttons, or you can't have two form context menus with the same action name. So from that standpoint, it makes sense. Let's, there, there are some out of the box that have special meaning, and these often start out with the term sys verb. If you've gone digging into the out of box UI actions, you probably see one called sys verb insert, sys verb insert an update or this verb. There, there's several of them. Well, there is one that I came across called sysverb cancel. That's the special one that says save, but don't pay it. Do, do whatever the script says. It's not even necessarily save. Do whatever the script says, but don't pay attention to the mandatory fields. Okay, look, comments in here, save without mandatory fields enabled. Now, I'm going on faith. This used to work years ago. I don't know if somebody changed the API or not. Let's do... Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. There was a way to... Eh, never mind. Let's just go current.update and action.set redirect URL, which we just talked about. Put current in there. It will stay on the same page. We can even put in a gs.info, add info message. Saved draft. All right, there's our script. Save that. So it's going to update the record, display a message, and then stay on the current record. Let's reload that form. It's going to say, do you want to give up your changes? Yes, I do, because I need my new save as draft button. Okay, I could even give that a lovely color. Form style. Destructive which should be red. Reload that. And I will now see a big red button. It's a save as draft. Warning, Will Robinson. Okay, let's go John Q. Public again. Tab, social security number comes in. I probably have a UI policy that says, hey, if this is empty, don't show the social security number. You can't. And again, if I try to do a save, it will say, you don't have a social security number. If I do a save as draft, I can save that data. The draft has been saved, the record was created, and it's ignored. So use this appropriately in a process where you want to save a draft. You want to save the information you've got before moving on. I commonly use this in conjunction with a state field so that I could tell, is this still in the draft state where somebody's filling this out and it's not quite done? Or are they ready to consider a new active open record, then move it to the next state? Okay. You could do that with a little bit of validation on the uh, mandatory fields as well. So no client script, three lines of server script, very easy to do. In fact, I'm going to take this and put it in here as another script we route. Easy to do. There was a discussion in the chat and it is still ongoing sometime even hours later. Uh, not sure I understand the context to the, of the fixed script. Maybe somebody can get me up to speed on that conversation. I might have missed something. So thank you, everybody, who's joined the live chat discussion and participating in that as well. So that's sysverb under cancel. One more that I wanted to run across, and that was something I had heard about but have not tested. So we're going to test this live together. Are strings in business rule conditions case sensitive? Oops, sorry. Let's go find out. So I need to think of a use case real quick around this. Business rule for this. I am in studio. Let's go create server development business rule. And 
record updated. I don't care. Let's do CLS person again. That'll be our table. And I need an advanced so that I get the condition. So before I do an insert or update, I'm not going to leave a condition here. Let's try a condition here. And what have I got on the form that I can use? Mm, I need a string, I need a string, I need a string. Comments. So let's do current dot comments. Uh, contains. I could do an index of, but that way I would know. Let's see. Let's just do test lowercase. Okay, single quotes. And if it does, we'll do gs.add info message. Uh, test acknowledged. Acknowledged. I blame it on jet lag, but I haven't been traveling too far out of my time zone lately. There we are. Simple before business rule. And I want to know if this is still the case. I read this in a document authored by somebody else whom I trust, but I've never tested it before. So let's put comments in here. Let's say test, save. Oops, save as draft. And it says draft saved. I do test and do save as draft. Test acknowledged. Interesting. Okay. So here's the quiz. How do we make that case insensitive? Easy enough. You can add to uppercase. Let's try that. And then say that. Update it there. That will convert whatever you enter to uppercase and compare it against an already existing uppercase one. So let's do all lowercase, save as draft, test acknowledged, and then try a mixed case, save as draft, test acknowledged, all uppercase, save as draft, test acknowledged. Hooray! Uh, seems confusing as someone didn't know what sysverb cancel was actually doing. So the comment about sysverb cancel, say with manager, if it, that's where the comments field comes in handy. Use sysverb under cancel. Cancel to ignore mandatory fields. Mandatory fields and run the script part. My next question is, if that's the case with the condition field in business rules, is it also the case with the condition field in UI actions? My gut tells me yes, it's the same rules, but let's find out. Okay, so current dot condition uh, comments equals, let's try it this way, lowercase test, save, reload form, and if it is lowercase test, ah, I don't have the UI action because it doesn't match. If I save this, it's going to bark about the social security number. And now I get it. If I put an uppercase letter in there, I save and it's not there. Important thing to note, these condition fields are in fact case sensitive, which would make sense. Sometimes when you're doing a glide record query, they're not. Actually, none of the time when you're doing a glide record query, so let's do the other way around with this one and say to lowercase test, and now it should always be there. Let's do that. Let's reload the form. And we have our perfectly mixed up case of test. There it is. Test. Save button is there. Works great. So sysverb cancel. Two things we learned today. Sysverb cancel for ignoring mandatory fields in a UI action. 
Just give it the action name there. And case sensitivity on condition statements. So here's the other question. If I use, oops, the business rule, went to the wrong tab. What if I did not that, but the when to run said comments is test. Is that case sensitive? Save that. What did I do over here on my business rule? Why does it think it needs to be updated? It doesn't. Okay. Good for you. Oh, because I was on the business rule. Sorry, I got my tabs mixed up. Okay, that happens sometimes. So my condition isn't going to run the script there. It's going to check this. Easier to write, but is what is the behavior? Don't know. I don't do this too often. Usually if I'm writing a script, I use that condition field. If I'm not writing a script, then I use the condition builder. So reload the form. And this contains test. I save as draft. I don't think I changed anything, so it might not have even recognized that. Save. Test acknowledged. Okay. Uppercase. Save. <laughs> the condition builder is also... Ooh, that's ugly. Okay. <laughs> uh, how do you get your way out of that one? I would have thought this would be case insensitive, but it is case sensitive. Hmm. Rather than saying eh, or for every permutation, I haven't done matches pattern and match regex recently with any success. I wonder if contains will do it. We're, we're poking around in the dark just to see where it leads us. Let's do that. Change the record. Save the record. Nope. Contains doesn't say test acknowledged. Interesting, interesting. Okay, so if you want case insensitive searches, you have to go to the condition statement. If I save that as all lowercase, it says test acknowledged. Fascinating. But if you don't check advanced, advanced says I want these extra fields. It, it, it pops out the before or the order, the when. I got a couple extra types. I've got an advanced tab to do this. What if yeah, you can't you can't use this if you don't have advanced. So your action becomes let's do this. All uppercase test saved. I want to know what combinations you can use these in. So I had a message from the action tab. Let's turn off annotations for a moment. Thank you. Leave advanced on, but don't do advanced. Take the when to run. There's no condition on that. So right now it should run every time. So one, save draft. Test saved, good. Can you use advanced with that message? So the reverse of what I was doing, trying to use the condition builder with a script, this is not use the condition builder, but use the condition field with a not a script. I know that sounds kind of weird. So here's my not a script action. It's not a scripted action. But I think this condition only works when you have, it says, am I going to run the script or not? So current.comments.to uppercase equals test. Make your quotes match one for one. Update. Is it always going to run that action? Or will it run both? Let's find out. This is how we learn. Save as draft. Test saved ran. But that doesn't necessarily mean the condition happened or not. Okay. 
js.add info message script was run. Now we'll know who's doing what where. Learning more about business rules than I thought I ever knew. Two, let's go to three, save as draft. Script was run. Message from the message field. Let's put this to hi. Save that. Aha. Huh. So that's interesting. Let's make one more change in here. Under actions, let's set the order to 100. If it runs, because that just says, will anything else in the action field happen? Aside from just printing out a message, let's change a field value. Then we've got advanced, which is printing out a message. So these two, this, I think I'm understanding the condition versus the condition, the filter conditions. I suspect both have to evaluate to true. When one is blank, doesn't matter. We're going to test that next. So we tried the condition, the filter conditions, this one. We tried this with a script. We know that the filter conditions can control whether the script runs or not. I believe I just validated that the reverse is true, that the condition script field controls whether the actions happen or not. Because I know that these work. This, if you do a scriptless business rule and you say, look, I'm just going to make a condition and I'm going to make some actions, boom, bam, done. Okay, very easy to do. It's been around for a while. And I've also known that even longer that this condition affects this. But I didn't know if there was any cross-wiring that goes on. I'm sure this is probably well-documented somewhere. <laughs> but it's more fun figuring it out. And you learn more. Okay, so if this contains the word test, and I save it, this gets set to 100, the message is displayed, the script was run, everything happens just lovely. Let's turn this back to maybe 14 and make this something nonsensical. Save that, no script running, no value change. Okay. Now to test the full theory. So we know that this condition field controls both the script and the actions, which would say to me that the, let's do age is greater than 18, which sounds a bit ominous in itself. Save that. Now let's see if both of them have to evaluate to true to get that thing to run. So we set this to test. It could be that one has priority over the other. I don't know. Aha. Huh. Age is not 21. This contains test. The script was run. I'm thinking the condition field has power over the filter conditions. That easy to write condition builder. Let's take this part out for a moment. Save. And uh, change it back to something nonsensical. We should see nothing run. What? I have a condition that says Oh, age is greater than 18. I'm sorry. Let's do less than 18 just to have fun. Both conditions were true. <laughs> we haven't proved anything yet. Okay. Bad rules. My fault. Okay, this says it must be less than 18 and contained. No, there's no test in there. Just less than 18. So change something. Change that, save record, and as predicted, nothing happens. Put in the word test, save, nothing happens. Neither of those two things happen because I'm not caring about the comments right now. Make this 17, 
save that. They both run. I've got, it doesn't matter because I'm only looking at one condition. Okay, so I know that the condition builder is less than 18 is working. Put this back in. And now we will determine if somebody has precedence over the other or if they both have to evaluate to true. So let's go 21, save. That kind of validates that both have to be true. Right, let's do something nonsense there. And 17 here, save. Nothing happens. Test, save. Not that you would do this on a regular basis to use both the condition field and the filter conditions, but it's nice to know how those relate to each other and how they relate to the other actions in advance. So that's what I wanted to know more about those two fields and what they do and how they do it. And that brings me to the end of the hour. Thank you very much for joining me. I will make these scripts available as mentioned on GitHub. And until the next time I see you, take care, go out and learn something, share it, be helpful to others. Thanks. Bye.